Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicole Bernier. I'm a PhD political scientist and I work as an expert scientific advisor at the National Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policy located in Montreal. I will be facilitating this event today for the next 75 minutes. This webinar is entitled Striking a balance between decentralization and centralization in public health systems. It is part of a research project led by Sarah Allen, Andrew Pinto, and Laura Rosella, three researchers from the University of Toronto. The research project is aimed at comparing variations in public health systems across Canadian provinces and territories. The National Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policy is hosting this event and has been part of the research project working group since 2020. The webinar is developed in collaboration with the research team. It will present results from the research program, which conducted in-depth case studies of provincial public health systems in Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec. I will, um, okay, I'm trying to shift the slide. I will uh, be facilitating this webinar today with the help of Martin Renault, an expert scientific advisor working at the center. Also, we are also joined by Camille Mercier and Laila Mamoudi, who are responsible for the technical and logistical support. Our two speakers are Sarah Allen and Rob Smith. Both are from the University of Toronto. Sarah Allen is an associate professor of health policy at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation, Dalla Lana School of Public Health. She's, the direct, she's also the director of the North American Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, a collaborative partnership and research center focused on subnational and international health systems research to support evidence-informed policymaking. Sarah's research and teaching span comparative health systems and policies, health system performance, and health equity. Rob Smith is, a, is an assistant professor at the Division of Social and Behavioral Health Sciences, Dalalana School of Public Health, and a public health practitioner. Rob is a social epidemiologist and applied health systems researcher by training, holding a Doctor of Philosophy in Population Health from the University of Oxford. His research interests span the social determinants of non-communicable uh, disease and health system performance, with particular emphasis on human and organizational relationships. I want to thank both of them for accepting our invitation. Before we proceed to uh, the, 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 the conference, uh, I, I need to go over some housekeeping matters. Uh, just to tell you that the the presentation, this will be a joint presentation by uh, Sarah and uh, Bob and Rob, so, sorry. And uh, they will um, uh, present for about 40 minutes. Uh, if you have any questions that you want to address to the speakers, there will be an exchange uh, period at the end of the presentation. Uh, for about uh, 20 to uh, 30 minutes. Uh, so uh, please write the questions that you want to address to the speakers in the Q&A uh, box. If you have any technical uh, issues, for instance, the, the screen is frozen, we don't see the presentation and so on, please use the chat and also to, to share uh, references or comments that you want to address to um, other participants, please use the chat box. The webinar and the exchanges, the chat and the question and answer, uh, question and answers are recorded. The recorded, recording will be made available on our website and the evaluation form will be 
shared at the end of the webinar. So if you're able to uh, fill it, uh, fill it up the form, uh, it will be very helpful for uh, for us to improve our uh, contents and processes and and formats. Everything will also be sent by email. Uh, a few words about uh, the, our center. Um, as you may know already, you might be interested to know that our center is part of a network of uh, uh, collaborating centers for public health uh, distributed uh, uh, across Canada in different parts of the country. Uh, so uh, it was uh, established, this network or this, uh, the, the centers were uh, established in 2005, and they are funded through the Public Health Agency of Canada. The six national collaborating centers for public health work together to promote the use of scientific research and other knowledge to strengthen public health practices, programs, and policies in Canada. Um, each uh, NCC focuses on a different public health priority. So we have indigenous health, uh, determinants of health, environmental health, infectious diseases, methods and tools, and uh, healthy public policy. The National Collaborate, Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policies, uh, public policy is located in Montreal. Our mandate is to support public health actors in their efforts to develop and promote healthy public policies. So we're working on different uh, projects, analyzing public policies, climate change, health and all policies, health inequalities, health impact assessment, knowledge sharing, population mental health and wellness, public health ethics and infrastructure. We acknowledge that we are on a a, on an age-old indigenous territory, a place of meeting and diplomacy between peoples and the site of the signing of the Great Peace Treaty. We thank the Kenya Kahaka Nation for their hospitality on this unceded territory. As Sarah is getting ready to begin their presentation, I take a couple more seconds to mention uh, that no less than 300 people are registered for this webinar. Many of you are, are attending the live session and others will watch later. Most of you come from Canada and we have people from all across the country. It is worth mentioning that in, uh, even though we have a, the NCCHPP has a uh, Canadian uh, mandate, uh, we have, uh, there, there are a number of participants from other countries, uh, including the USA and the UK, but also countries as diverse as Bhutan, Germany, es Eswatini, Nigeria, Nepal, Taiwan, Cameroon, New Zealand, and Uzbekistan. Welcome to all of you from Canada and from all uh, other parts of the world. And over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that uh, kind introduction. I'm setting up my screen. I hope it's uh, working okay for you. Um, should you, do you see the right, uh, you see my slides now? Yes. Wonderful. I'm, uh, it's just wonderful to be here to be able to share some of our research findings uh, in the study that's in its final stages and uh, great to be here with my colleague, uh, Dr. Rob Smith, who spent a great deal of his postdoctoral fellowship working on this project uh, with me and the team. So the work was funded by CIHR um, and so we're really grateful to have had that funding support to do the work. Um, this was actually part of a um, catalyst grant that CIHR struck in 2020 on measuring the impacts of financial and organizational restructuring on public health. And this preceded the pandemic. Um, and so you'll see uh, the, the themes of this Catalyst Grant woven through um, the research that inevitably took a bit of a shift toward a more pandemic focus. Um, and we're extremely grateful to the many 
local experts uh, within public health systems and stakeholders across multiple provinces who were just so generous and uh, and kind to, to help us with this work, reviewing drafts of reports and participating as key informants in the study. Um, such incredible generosity uh, given the immense stress and, and immeasurable um, uh, stress placed on them during the pandemic as being uh, many of them on the front lines. Um, and you know this this work was um, really uh, wouldn't have been possible without everyone's uh, in, listed here on the slide. Um, and for those who have been continuing to work to keep us all safe, we're extremely grateful. And I am uh, I'm personally just very grateful to, to all of you and those on the webinar as well who have been working in public health. Um, the broader project, public um, pro project team is, is here, listed here. Many of them um, hopefully are joining today on the webinar. And uh, the working group has, has been really instrumental and has included the National Collaborating Center, as, as Nicole noted, which we're very grateful. So as everyone is uh, well aware now, the um, general public and policymakers' attention on public health has never been greater. Um, so it's really critical that we seek to learn from what, went, what has gone on, what has gone well, what have the major challenges been in order to help shape and, and provide insight into what the future of public health systems might look like in order to be resilient, to be effective, to be equitable and responsive. And as I mentioned, the main impetus for this research was really the a catalyst grant that was articulated by CRHR around the, the, real, the real lack of information and evidence and research that was attending to the um, past reforms that had been undertaken to health systems in Canada that were seen to various degrees and shapes and forms across the country. And so we were particularly interested in gaining insight into those system structures and how they've been reformed in recent years and the impacts they've had on public health. And so the key questions that were really guiding this work included understanding how those health system re uh, reforms impacted the public health sector in general and during the COVID response in particular, but also how COVID pandemic um, really um, changed or impacted public health systems as well. I think I can move this out of the way here. <laughs> um, and so that's really the, the guide, although we have this broad ambition to sort of provide insights to shape future reform, we're really focused on a few key research questions guiding this work. And so the overall conceptual framework that uh, informed our study was um, this sort of you know, systems level framework that's informed by WHO's essential public health operations which also really aligns well with Canada's Chief Public Health Officer's uh, recent annual report, which provided a beautiful and clear description of public health systems, including their aims, functions, and building blocks. So briefly here, our working definition for public health systems is the collection of public sector organizations with a mandate for public health. So these public sector organizations will necessarily interact with many other um, public uh, partners, for example, in the health system, as well as private sector and industry, NGOs and community organizations, but we're really focused on that core of the, those with a clear mandate for public health. And those that are focused on as part of their mandate, one of the core functions of public health, which I've listed here on the slide, including both the health intelligence functions, health promotion, health protection, and emergency response and preparedness, as well as disease prevention. And the focus of our work is primarily on the enablers or the structures underpinning those and enabling those core functions to be effective. And that includes the organization. So who are the actors involved and, and um, you know, how do they work together? The governance is really about the approach taken to set priorities, the strategic, um, sort of strategy setting and how resources are allocated, as well as performance measurement and monitoring of the public health system. And then financing is essentially around how the funds are generated and allocated to public health uh, and workforce questions around the supply of the workforce, the skill mix and the approaches for workforce policy and planning. And this was really informative to our work and we were drawing on this framework in multiple phases of this project in which we proceeded first in phase one 
to uh, sort of conduct as comprehensive liter literature review as possible to really to provide a detailed description of the public health system in each province and territory in Canada. And we would, you know, relied on local expert review to help fill in some of the gaps where possible when they had time um, and often didn't have as much time as they would have liked, but dealing with other more urgent priorities. But we're really delighted to have been uh, working closely with the National Collaborating Center on Healthy Public Policy to translate, edit, and publish these uh, profiles that are available on their website. And so we have some uh, starting to be available and it's a work in progress, but there are some already on um, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, and Nova Scotia and uh, we're excited to continue working on those. And the second phase is really where we're paying most attention today. It's the case studies of a subset of provincial public health systems in Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta. And we're drawing on interviews from a wide range of public health system leaders to gain insights into how past health reforms have impacted public health and how those were experienced during the pandemic. And then phase three was focused on the informing and de the development of a performance measurement framework. What are the key considerations to moving towards a pan-Canadian approach for performance measurement? We won't have time to get into that today, unfortunately. We're focused mainly on phase two, but just want to lay out the broader program of work. So in addition to drawing on the framework of public health systems, we also really look to the literature on health system decentralization to understand the mechanisms by which various degrees and types of health system decentralization and centralization may impact public health systems specifically. So broadly, what we learn in this literature is that, you know, decentralization is generally refers to a, a shift or redistributing of power, resources, or responsibility, usually from larger uh, units of government to smaller territorial units of government or, or authorities. So from provinces in Canada, for instance, to regional health authorities would be a classic example of decentralization in the health systems in Canada. And the most of the focus of the literature in the literature is on this sort of top down process of decentralizing, assuming that there's power held centrally. And this is then a, there's a decision made to shift some of that um, to the periphery. But there's also a sense that there's, you know, power may be distributed across different actors and then there may be a bottom-up process by which communities and local governments may choose to shift power to more to the center in a sort of effort to centralize. And so we need to consider it possibly going in both directions. But there's three broad types of decentralization, both the political, which is really how our federation works with political decentralization to the provinces to have political authority for their own um, populations. And within health systems, what we see as more common is the fiscal and administrative decentralization, where on the one hand, fiscal decentralization really describes the extent to which the local authorities are able to raise revenues uh, locally, or the extent to which the, these funds are transferred from a central government and the authority that they have to actually make decisions about those expenditures. And then administrative decentralization is the distributing of um, redistribution of authority, responsibility for providing or ensuring the provision of public services among the different levels of, of government. And so broadly, there are lots of discussion and debate in the literature around, you know, what are the benefits and advantages to moving towards more of a decentralized structure and really briefly drawing on you know, a range of political science and economics literature, the theoretical benefits of decentralization relate mainly to decisions being closer to the ground. There's perhaps better alignment between the, um, you know, the design and the, the, the consideration around how the programs and services need to be delivered with the needs and the preferences of those local populations. But there's also other benefits around potential for experimentation with decentralized units, sharing information about what's working well and, and um, it, you know, ensuring that those data and lessons learned are shared, then there could be some benefits to that. On the flip side, there's, you know, strengths of centralization relate to the potential to reduce some regional inequalities and consistencies in quality or availability of care, for instance. But also uh, arguments made around efficiency that you know economies of scale may be um, gained through consolidating um, some high cost or really technical programs and services that might benefit from economies of scale, like spreading out some of the huge fixed costs of 
um, of some you know human resources or information technology over a larger volume can increase efficiency. Very briefly, but how does this play out in, in the Canadian context? Um, I've tried to depict on this slide. So as I mentioned, the focus of our case studies was on these three provinces listed here. And here we're trying to summarize the level of authority very crudely for healthcare in the first row and then public health in the second row. And broadly across Canada, there's been a trend towards centralization in health systems. And in Alberta, this um, you know, has, has had a centralized structure both for healthcare and public health since 2008 when it uh, consolidated its regional authorities into a single arm's length authority of Alberta Health Services, to which the government has delegated, delegated the administrative authority for health care and for some public health functions, and has set up hierarchically decentralized administrative zones within, within that hierarchical structure. And in Quebec, after a reform in 2015 that removed a regional layer of the system, the regional public health departments were consolidated with 22 local integrated health and social services centers, leaving in place this sort of quasi what we're calling still regionalized, although it looks different from other regionalized provinces in Canada, but still it sort of leaves in place these regional bodies with some degree of authority for planning both healthcare and public health. Um, and it represented a shift towards centralization because of this removal of a regional layer. And the, you know, these, these regions that are left in place are seen as sort of branches of local branches of a central government. And in Ontario, there's also been somewhat of a trend towards centralization in healthcare with Ontario Health, a new agency consolidating the, the existing local health integration networks and part of those functions in 2019 though with some decentralization in healthcare, also with new Ontario health teams that represents a bit of coordination of, of local providers into decentralized teams um, with, with authority over their local populations. And that's still playing out and being implemented. And then within, um, in public health, uh, the sort of, you know, Ontario remains unique in having a decentralized um, public health uh, structure with 40, 34 local public health units uh, in place. Although in 2019, there were some um, uh, consultations around uh, some plans to consolidate some of these public health units. And this was put on pause uh, during the pandemic. So what we hope to convey here um, is some of the key organizational differences in the public health systems across these three cases that we really um, did some in-depth uh, research on. And so the approach that we took was to undertake in-depth interviews with public health system leaders across these three provinces. And you know, these interviews were conducted you know, with, um, in each of these three provinces, but recruitment took place at various times during the pandemic. And so what we're showing on this slide is the timing of the recruitment and the interviewing um, of the, uh, the, the informants relative to um, COVID case counts in that province. And so we you know, identified a wide range of uh, people to invite based on their role in leadership roles in, in public health, both in local and regional, but also in provincial level. Largest share of participants were from more urban areas and located within the local or regional public health department or authority. Um, and many of them were serving as medical officers of health and directors or manager level uh, administrators. And so we interviewed uh, 58 individuals across the three uh, provinces. And then, you know, using a really um, prolonged approach of coding and then thematic analysis, we, you know, relied heavily on our conceptual framework uh, to develop that interview guide and then use that to develop a coding framework. And, you know, the in-depth thematic analysis allowed us to sort of characterize the the, the patterns that were emerging within each case and then did a cross case analysis to really tease out some of those similarities and differences in the themes across these jurisdictions. So I just skipped ahead, but I'll go back. Um, before I turn it over to uh, Rob to present some of the findings, I just wanna share some of the limitations and caveats here. This is not an exhaustive list, there are many. This was one single research project um, taking place during, during the pandemic at a point in time in the pandemic that is different from where we are now. Um, that's one of the limitations. But another one is that in Canada, we're really not able to 
separate out decentralization from integration of public health and healthcare. And you know why this is important, we can you know speak about in maybe the Q and A and and when Rob's sharing some of the findings. But it's um, you know in in the more centralized systems of Alberta and Quebec, public health and healthcare are more administratively integrated, falling within more of a you know common operational leadership structure with more of a shared mandate and budget even though they might not be operating as functionally integrated, which would imply an active coordination and shared information systems and shared performance objectives. But the degree of integration was, you know, would require more, more analysis, but we're really, we're not able to separate that out from in Ontario where there's, you know, both decentralization and neither administrative nor functional integration between public health and healthcare. So it's not possible to analytically separate those. We're also not really establishing any causal relationships between system structures and pandemic response, for instance, and we're really seeking to learn about the experiences of public health practitioners working in different types of systems in order to draw out some of the potential um, you know, associations between system structure and, and public health practice. But we're also focusing mainly on people in leadership positions in public health systems within those core sort of public sector organizations responsible for public health. So we are missing other perspectives that would be really useful and interesting to explore in, in future work. So I will hand it over to Rob. He's got a bit of a Wi-Fi uh, signal issue, so I'm not sure if we'll see him, but we should hear him and I'll just advance the slides for him as well. So over to you, Rob. Hello, bonjour. Uh, thank you so much for, for this opportunity to speak and Sarah for starting us off. Um, I will be heading back into the darkness uh, to, to, to speak uh, due to Wi-Fi issues, but um, I did first also want to personally thank all the public health leaders participating in our studies um, and also all um, so many health workers who have been unrelenting, especially in the past um, two years mm -hmm. to promote and protect the health and well-being of communities um, and also create more equitable and just health systems in societies. Um, so in terms of where we'll start with our results, um, we'll start with what participants described as the contextual factors driving centralization reforms and the perceived impacts of these reforms. <clears throat> participants suggested con the context motivating reforms in each province centered around the potential cost savings and efficiency improvements of consolidating decision-making authority and reorganizing public health operations that were seen or framed as inefficient or administratively costly. Participants described political interests and optics that forced and or facilitated the rapid implementation of reforms without explicit consideration of or the intent to strengthen essential public health operations. A point of interest in Alberta was the government's motivation to reduce inter-regional competition um, between powerful regional health authorities, primarily uh, those with jurisdiction over major urban centers. And a quote from one of our participants in Alberta, start quote, there was less willingness to share resources or to pool capacity or to develop things jointly between regions. So I think there was frustrations at a political level, end quote. With regards to impacts, participants in Alberta actually described several beneficial impacts of centralization reforms related to streamlining of leadership, reduce, reducing some duplication and improving standardization of some public health programs and services across health regions. Centralization was seen as making it easier to identify regional variation in public health service delivery, but also noted challenges that came with standardization. One quote goes, one of the first things that the new super health agency did was, that, was to ask, well, what programs are core? and anything that wasn't delivered in every single part of the province got axed. And that included things that were in fact better than what was existing, end quote. And so the next slide mm -hmm. speaks more specifically to the impacts of health system centralization uh, reforms. And centralization, first was seen to sever relationships or impede opportunities for interaction between public health and community-based organizations with shared interests around population health and health equity. 
One participant from Quebec described, uh, start quote, the atrophy of proximity, how we work with local actors and not just within health, but the cities and community organizations, end quote. With public health departments experiencing greater challenges being or becoming less responsive to local community health needs. It was the prospect of losing connection to local residents and organizations, municipal resources, and levers for policy levers for policy change and the ability to hear and have voices of equity seeking communities reflected in public health decision making that raised concern among participants in Ontario. Most participants in Quebec expressed unfavorable views about the impacts of the 2015 health system reform. In particular, some felt that the restructuring had not yet achieved improved intersectoral collaboration, though in Alberta participants reported that centralization helped improve coordination and planning, particularly between public health and healthcare sectors. One, participate, one participant stated that, start quote, we're able to kind of coordinate with the larger structure and be able to have better alignment. And if we need to have resources moved around, we can do that. If there are strategies that need to be co-developed, there's more opportunity to do that, end quote. Finally, participants explained concerns regarding decision makers within centralized health systems, prioritizing curative healthcare services for investment over preventative public health services and programs. Participants described how centralization reforms involved funding reductions for public health requiring prioritization of specific public health operations such as communicable disease control over health promotion and the whittling of workforce through subsequent defunding of public health program areas or shifting operations to different agencies without the same complement of staff. And so those, those pieces of the conversation were specifically related to the context for and impact of centralized or health system, significant health system reforms. And so specifically now with the uh, COVID-19 context, we wanted to understand what were some structural facilitators and impediments to what were perceived as effective COVID-19 responses. Public health systems in Quebec and Alberta were described as being better positioned to launch and coordinate province-wide response measures during the early part of the COVID-19 pandemic compared to Ontario. Specific facilitators thought to contribute to effective responses included faster provincial decision-making, information flow from provincial to regional actors, and clear roles and responsibility among health system actors, and greater ease in redirecting resources from across the health system to support public health functions. A lack of timely guidance from provincial leaders and a fully operational provincial health coordinating structure was described as impeding effective COVID-19 responses in Ontario. Where provincial leadership and coordination structures were limited, participants in Ontario described how the legislated authority and autonomy of local medical officers of health and public health units as a facilitator of local COVID-19 responses, allowing for more timely and locally adapted public health measures. However, Regional medical officers of health in Alberta and uh, regional public health directors in Quebec described the authority and autonomy constraints that impacted their ability to communicate publicly and coordinate across sectors regionally and locally. A participant from Alberta reflected on the following, start quote, the independence of local medical officers of health to respond to the local conditions in terms of the pandemic is weighed down. The number of MOHs who have given interviews or made statements in the public throughout the last year is way down compared to a normal year. And it's been operated as a military operation where the chief MOH at the top is the one who speaks for everyone. And there are strengths to that. You know, in a crisis, you don't want confusing messages, but there are also weaknesses because there is, you know, public health is committed to diversity. And there are differences in where the organism is striking and who's at risk, and those should be responded to locally, end quote. Factors thought to have impeded effective COVID-19 responses across jurisdictions and therefore potentially were independent of public health system centralization included perceived opacity of provincial government decision-making 
pre-pandemic levels of investment in public health, particularly impacting workforce surge capacity and informa information technology, information systems infrastructure, and challenges presented by ambiguity in the roles and responsibilities of provincial, provincial actors with respect to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis health. Describing frustrations with provincial decision-making approaches in Ontario, one participant expressed, start quote, so you see decisions that are announced and you think, you're trying to think, well, how did that align with the province's public health measures table what, and what they recommended? Which is another longstanding Ontario characteristic of having special tables that do things in secrecy, end quote. The final group of questions of, uh, in our conversations um, were with regards to the impacts of the pandemic response itself on public health systems. And the following themes emerged across provinces. The COVID-19 pandemic created a need for intensified collaborations and partnerships in public health. The mechanisms enabling these new ways of working varied, in some cases, multi-sectoral or liaison tables or working groups were set up to coordinate the COVID-19 response in other COVID-19 response. In other cases, memoranda of understanding or other agreements between parties were established as described by one participant in Alberta, start quote, we've got community-based community organizations who are immunizing their client population under the delegation of a medical officer of health and it's a formal arrangement, end quote. The pandemic also brought about closer working and potentially reporting relationships between MOHs and other health system leaders, for example, health agency chief executive officers, leading to more opportunities for public health leaders to influence and bring public health lens to health system decision making. As described by a participant in Quebec, start quote, the proximity we have to power, that's clearly a transformative leverage that we didn't have before. If we're able to maintain that, at least for the first part of the recovery, that would be extraordinary. Discussion and discussions are happening about what the involvement will be for me as a public health director with the senior administration team for the coming months, end quote. There is also significant redeployment and hiring of new staff in response to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Although redeployment was seen as necessary, there was concern about the impact of the impact on non-COVID um, related uh, services and programs, but still essential public health operations. The injection of emergency funding into public health systems facilitated hiring to respond to the pandemic and address surge capacity limitations that existed um, before the pandemic. Most particip participants welcomed the new funding and the opportunity to bolster the health public health system, even if it came with challenges hiring and training amidst an emergency but it was also acknowledged that there was no long-term guarantee of increased funding. Participants from Alberta and Ontario in particular also discussed the investments in and changes to information systems and digital technologies utilized to support the communicable disease uh, surveillance operations and other public health services. For example, improved accessibility to virtual services and remote working within public health agencies. Finally, participants thought that the pandemic had raised appreciation for and the profile of health protection and emergency response operations and created the possibility to have broader discussions about other public health operations in public and health system realms. And those were the main findings of uh, the, our interviews with um, at least a summary of our main findings. Uh, with participants. Thanks, thanks, Rob. And glad your Wi-Fi allowed you to 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 provide all of those insights. Um, and I'll just try and wrap up before turning it over to our um, to Nicole for moderating the the Q and A. Um, so you know, this is one research study that among many that will be focused on public health systems and how how they're designed and. 
And so we don't have definitive answers on how on that pressing question of striking the right balance um, between centralization and decentralization, but we hope this this research can help make these discussions about trade offs and implications of systems reforms a little bit more explicit. Um, so we know that the, the theory of decentralization suggests that there's, you know, that the decisions made closer to the ground will should better serve and meet the needs and preferences of local populations. And but this necessarily depends on the extent and inclusiveness of citizen engagement. Um, and you know, in, in public policy generally, but in public health specifically, we know that the need for strong partnerships with community and robust sort of data surveillance at local level and you know um, attention to to equity is, is is vital like community engagement and participation in the design of the public health programs is really critical to the acceptance and take up of public health measures which have been made extremely um, you know well uh, very clear during the pandemic so the meaningful engagement of non-governmental actors and local communities is even more important in public health than even, you know, in, in health systems more broadly. So what's, you know, the, there will be a tension and there al always will be this tension between the need for public health work to be done in close collaboration with local communities and the need for coordination and, you know, the messaging and capacity to be consistent to enable uh, sort of consistent quality and availability of programs and services. But I think, you know, in the literature, some argue that this, this tension may be a constructive one. And I, I'm curious to hear the thoughts of people participating in this webinar and, and whether this, um, you know, having discussions about these in terms of what works well locally, what we can learn for the more, more decentralized systems and where more centralized supports are needed, um, whether this is a constructive one that we can have in thinking about rebuilding health systems. Um, and so some of the themes that came up that Rob mentioned, in addition to local connections and engagement, public health requires a level of independence uh, that, from political actors that's even greater than in other aspects of public policy. And, you know, it's a long held, um, you know, understanding of public health that this independence is required because of the very strong political interests that conflict with many public health goals. Um, but the impacts that decentralization has on independence really depends on the, the type of decentralization, the level of authority that the decentralized units have. And, you know, this is an empirical question that we don't have answers to yet, but we think it would be really important to address in future to really understand more about, you know, the, the level of independence, the level of authority that, that the um, public health decentralized units have and the, you know, decentralized regional health authorities have and, and to, to learn more about how that is constraining or enabling public health functions. Um, and so many of the priorities that were identified included, you know, things that won't be you know, surprising to people around the need to invest in partnerships, the need to support intersectoral action locally, but also centrally. Um, another key takeaway from our work is that there, there seems to have been a, 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 um, a perception of a lack of consideration of public health views and perspectives during the planning and implementation of broader systems reform. And so as health systems inevitably will continue and perhaps even escalate their um, structural reforms and you know, experimenting with different types of regionalization, um, it's going to be really important to consider the, the views and expertise of public health within these discussions and planning for rebuilding the health systems in a post-pandemic era. These are just some of the thoughts that I had that I wanted to wrap up with, but I, what we wanted to save lots of time for, for questions and we really do look forward to, to hearing from you and, and engaging with you. So thank you so much. Nicole, we can't hear you. Thank you, Sarah and Rob. Um, so um, I just wanted to, uh, um, we are entering in the question uh, and exchange period. Um, so I would like you to, I would like to invite all participants to um, write uh, any questions you may have in the Q&A uh, box. Um, and I, I have seen uh, already a couple of questions written in, the, in this box. So if 
there are questions that uh, resonate more with you, please. Um, you can upvote the questions, so that will help us uh, to determine the priority uh, for questions. Um, I want to uh, share with you, before we go to the first question, uh, a few lighter facts about the audience. Uh, as you remember, before we, uh, when you registered to this, uh, uh, to, the, to this webinar, uh, you have uh, answered a few, a few survey questions. So uh, one of the questions asked to uh, registrants was, do you have prior experience of health systems reform as a professional or as a worker? So the, the answer is 14% uh, of you have quite a lot of experience of health system reform. 46% um, uh, have a little experience and 40% uh, have no experience. One open-ended uh, a question was, have you encountered difficulties pertaining to the organization of health that impacted the COVID-19 response? And uh, this time the answers are a little bit more difficult to, um, to uh, summarize, but uh, uh, we have uh, like among the answers were uh, the difficulties met by participants were challenges for communication and decision-making, at the local level, uh, system level, systems level silos and coordination across sectors, delays in specialty uh, health services, for instance, mental health and primary care, and difficulty connecting with them. There were also equity issues and slow access to resources and redeployment of staff. So this echoes to uh, some of the, the findings that were shared uh, by Sarah and uh, Rob uh, prior uh, to this. Um, so I found it interesting to, uh, to have a, a few, um, a few uh, uh, data about our participants. Um, now to, uh, to address the first question, as the, in, the questions are coming up in the, in the thread, uh, I would like uh, to start by uh, my own question for um, Sarah and Rob, is that, uh, you know, like uh, we, it's, it's obvious that we uh, are, we the public health systems have been uh, challenged by the COVID-19 uh, response and you, um, you, you discussed this, but um, like it, it is the nature of public health systems to face challenges one after the other. So other ones will be upcoming. We, we don't know exactly what they are. They might be those that we expect the most, climate change, the war in Ukraine, the consequences of that. Um, and they, they might be other ones that uh, surprise us by challenge. Uh, and we like to learn from lessons, but the challenges are always different in, you know, in the history of public health systems. So if we are, um, if we want to learn from lessons about the, the importance of the organization of public health systems uh, from your research, but we are also looking into the future like, how, like, you know, if provincial governments are looking to reform their systems, um, do you have indications or directions that, you know, not precise uh, solutions, but that they could follow? Like, would we, is it your hunch, your hunch that we should go for more decentralization, more centralization, better balance between the two? Like, uh, what have we learned? And what, how, can we, how can this be used for future challenges? Thanks, Nicole. That's a really tough question and lots of great questions are coming in. I've been busy reading and so grateful for people's engagement with this and hopefully they can help with the answers as well. This was one research project funded as a catalyst grant, which is meant to really start research that's going to be hopefully impactful and important. And so, just you know, with that caveat, we're really scratching the surface here. We did you know one 
uh, you know, method and and her uh, huge richness of, of insights that we hope is informative, but we, we really need to continue along this journey. Um, but I guess what the main takeaway for me is in this, this you know, richness of the variation we have in Canada and almost like a what if we our system looked a different way. We have that, you know, what if scenario playing out in our very country. And so being able to look into these different ways of organizing health systems, I think there's huge potential to start the learning and we're, you know, starting to do that. So I see great promise in drawing from those strengths that we heard from a very decentralized model that looks a lot like the United States and much like how public health used to be in Canada before uh, regionalization um, in the you know in the early 90s and that that strength of local connection was a huge theme that came out of the interviews where it was seen to be a threat in more of the centralized uh, systems shifting away from that local connection is critical in public health. And so how to maintain that in a you know, shifting model of health systems is going to be a critical consideration for preparedness to future crises. And yet there are some uh, great learnings from the shift toward a more integrated model with public health and healthcare working really closely in collaboration. So you can see some of the potential for, you know, taking more of a population health approach, which is again, part of the vision of public health playing out in those provinces that have sought to do that and perhaps pushing that even further to, you know, beyond just the sort of administrative integration to more functional integration may even have um, a greater kind of, impact on, on future preparedness in terms of that ability to share information really quickly. So information and, and share resources to res be responsive and insights into, in terms of addressing the unique needs of local communities and working closely to ensure that, you know, the, that equity is really at the forefront of those responses in future. Those are the sort of two broad takeaways I take from this, um, but I'm sure, Rob, I don't know if you want to add one, but I know we also have a lot of questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Nicole, for that question. And I think I can actually tie in a few, um, address some of um, the, the, the other questions in, in this response and just some reflections um, from what we've learned and, and what, what how what we learn uh, moving forward as um, health systems across jurisdictions in what's now called Canada uh, reform. Um, so a key piece, and I think this speaks to one of the um, um, Dr. Guyon's question comment about, you know, is is there a constructive tension in decentralization or centralization in the governance of, of public health? And so from this work, it sounds like they're, you know, centralizing certain functions and certain aspects of health systems. Um, you know, there there may be benefits and and address, uh, you know, widely documented um, um, uh, constraints in the health system, um, but at what cost? And and um, and so when it comes to decentralization, obviously the concern around connection to the local. Uh, local communities and especially the the experiences of equity seeking communities. So questions that raise or considerations that I think about when we think about, okay, where, where do we go from here? So in health system centralization reforms, we're seeing this movement towards centralizing um, power resource responsibilities. Key questions is like, where's the health system's ears and, and um, is it data collecting data on, on um, individuals and specifically, you know, expanding that to um, sociodemographic factors, or is it actually about having stronger relationships within um, communities at a local level? Um, is it through that process that we can understand the nuances and ensure that um, especially um, pandemic responses are, are um, are tailored and adapted um, to address the ongoing and um, you know systemic ways that equity-seeking communities are discriminated against, um, and so 
the so there's there's that question around whether the the however decentralized or centralized the health system is where is its ears and how is local knowledge being um, listened to and integrated into health system decision making um, another aspect of this that I want to draw on Dr. DiRigiro's uh, recent report um, with colleagues that are in attendance today um, around governance of public health systems moving forward. And one of the things that um, they mention is that um, if you know is a public health is you know espoused to be um, um, a champion for population health and health equity in the health system, um, but to fulfill that sort of mandate or, or um, um, that work, um, public health leaders and organizations need to be um, uh, equipped or have access to sufficient uh, authority resources and, um, and um, authority and resources and at decision um, making tables in order to, to fulfill that. And, um, and I think that's a salient point um, because um, and I think this is my third point um, related to whether just depending on the degree of centralization, cent decentralization, um, a lot of the impact of public health interventions, program services depends also on the priorities, knowledge and politics of folks in those leadership roles. Um, so in some cases, um, that may be, uh, those may align more closely with the the philosophy and values of um, public health, especially around health equity and justice, um, and sometimes it, it, it may not. So there may be times um, in a, a, a political history of um, a provinces whereby um, greater proximity to senior executive decision makers in government um, serves public health um, in a different way than um, in um, if uh, another um, other uh, in other phases of a, of a province's political history. And so I think in that, that's one example of where, where there can be that tension. Uh, and, and so a final summary, where do we go from here on that last point about leadership um, and the lens through which decision-making is made? Um, I think one of those key next steps um, is to, and, and this relates to uh, some of the work that Dr. Fafard and Hoffman's um, team um, have been working on for a long time around you know, the configuration of authority, responsibilities, and power of public health leaders in um, government capacities or in, in um, health agencies. Um, what is the appropriate configuration of these, these, these aspects? Um, um, is, is there a configuration, a typology that would support um, uh, really promote um, population health equity um, and public health operations. Um, I think that is a key area for next steps um, and hopefully uh, work that we can uh, continue um, in order to inform, um, you know, uh, reforms that are, are, are uh, net positive and, and equitable. So thank you so much for that uh, and I'll pause there. Uh, thank you to both of you. Um, I will uh, uh, read a question. Uh, I, I think many uh, questions are interrelated. So one uh, from Wendy Pringle, uh, have community service organizations had the opportunity to weigh on uh, how uh, public health organizational structure has impacted their access to public health resources? I heard mention of swift COVID response in Quebec as tied uh, to uh, centralization, but that was not the experience of community service organizations service, serve, serving BIPOC population, populations in the province who needed a great deal more COVID support than they got. Um, I don't know who wants to pick on this one, maybe Rob? Yeah, happy to start there. And Sarah, please feel free to jump in. And so it's such an important point. Um, and so uh, in our interviews, um, one participant um, described uh, this concern um, vocally. And, um, and perhaps this is a key place where the limitation of um, our, our sampling frame of primarily 
um, um, public health agencies with a formal mandate for public health uh, may have affected um, um, themes that elucidate, elucidated um, because uh, in terms of that perspective from community-based organizations, that was only, uh, we, it, that we weren't able to um, hear um, um, perhaps, I guess, enough of those perspectives for it to um, materialize into a cross-jurisdictional um, theme. So that's um, something that uh, was raised specifically in Quebec um, and, um, but uh, I think that also spoke to, um, that, that participant spoke to the issues around how is local knowledge and concerns um, being able to influence and, and inform um, decision-making even within regionalized um, health systems and that currently, and especially provincial um, um, government actors. Uh, and that was especially highlighted in those uh, Quebec interviews. So. Thank you for that um, a question and happy to follow up. Over to you, Sarah. Thank, Thank you. you. Anything? Uh, yeah, I think this is a really big gap in this particular research study that we do hope to fill in. It's a critically important perspective to kind of inter, you know, way, layer on the views of all of the um, perspectives outside of the core of the public health sector organizations that are interacting with using, informing, and engaging with public health, including community NGOs, those representing um, BIPOC communities, and other um, agencies in public and private sector. I would like to move to uh, another question, this time from uh, uh, Professor Patrick Fafar from the University of Ottawa. Did the research design allow for a consideration of the limits of the ability of the respondents to understand the system overall, that is their ability to see the proverbial forest for the trees? This is a great question. Um, thank you, Patrick, for this and for attending today. Um, so we, we did have this sort of phased approach to the study in order to you know, develop first this profile of the public health system. And to address another question right at the same time, by public health system, we're referring to those core public sector organizations with a mandate for public health. And that's, you know, the sort of less than 5% of the total health system budget is devoted to that core public health system. And so that's what we mean by public health system, which is a different uh, concept from uh, the bigger health system within which it is closely situated and partnering with. Um, and so this phased approach allowed us to both develop this you know, profile of what the public health system looks like from the perspective of governance, organization, financing, and workforce. We shared that in advance with all the key, key informants who agreed to participate in interviews so that they could read what has already been compiled and sort of see that hopefully the forest through the trees and then had the interview following that um, that may not have gotten around any issues that people will see what they what they want and we don't know how long people spent engaging with those reports but that was the the attempt of that research design. Rob? Did yeah, you want? Not, not too much to add um, besides um, uh, thanks to Dr. Fafford, your work is fascinating. Um, the, uh, our attempt to ensure, I think Sarah's already addressed this though, our, our attempt to ensure that like what, it, you know, to pick up signal and, and understand what are those key um, um, understand in depth the ways in which these structures, uh, the en enabling public health operations um, influence the pandemic responses and, and well, the impact of reforms on those. Um, we sampled folks, as mentioned, at different um, levels and different experiences. Those fo folks working within, um, within senior positions currently, um, formerly, uh, uh, as, as well to try and to understand um, often specifically those related to governance and organization, 
Um, we, uh, one limitation is that um, we had difficulty sampling um, folks who are currently working uh, within uh, provincial ministries of health. Um, and so while we did have some who were, um, we, I believe, uh, uh, very candid and generous in what they shared um, in, in some, uh, not all provinces were we able to speak with those working within the machinery of government um, and particularly at um, high levels um, at this time. Um, and so um, that is one area of um, um, voices that I think would help um, tease apart the proverbial forest from the trees um, and uh, definitely something, uh, an area for to, to address in, in future resource, uh, um, research, perhaps um, at a different, a better time in this um, less complex time for this type of research. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, 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 we have a, a little bit of time uh, for one more question. So I, I will combine one, uh, two popular questions uh, that are interrelated. You expect that this project will eventually be able to deliver insights on the right balance, because this is a theme of the, 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 the presentation. Uh, the right balance question, what criteria would effectively arbitrate among the decentralization uh, trade-offs? And also whether uh, we have, uh, whether you happen to know how the centralized and decentralized public health system functions in other countries, uh, for instance, uh, Scandinavian countries or other European countries uh, to determine if there has been success or the right balance has been more closely achieved. So coming back to the essential uh, right balance, uh, your insight on, on this, please. Yes, this is, um, we were trying to be provocative with our title of our presentation in order to draw a great crowd, which we did, and uh, we hope we haven't disappointed, but I really like the framing of this question in terms of criteria, because what I think we've been able to do here with this research, just sort of getting started in this public health systems research space around, you know, system structures and public health functions and pandemic response uh, specifically, was to you know draw out some of the um, key themes that were seen to be you know really challenging and those that are more enabling of public health functions that both are cross cutting so these are sort of criteria for effective public health systems uh, across the board and then those that were unique um, and and sort of specific to a more decentralized or centralized approach and. And so using those themes, I think we'll be able to at least draw some more attention to the types of criteria that you might need to consider and having these discussions explicitly, like this is, these are the decisions weighing on governments now in order to try to think about the restructuring of health systems. We know that the movement to consolidate regions is, is taking off in, in full, we're in full, full speed ahead with this in Canada. And so being able to, you know, consider really explicitly what you be what you might be losing and how to mitigate those losses as much as possible. And you know, the idea of the trade-offs um, between consistency of programming and then what others have commented in the questions in terms of what is the what is the impact of cutting some of those locally targeted programs. And that were seen to be effective at the expense of consistency. And so we're hoping to draw some light to, to the types of criteria you might apply. And then, you know, having that right balance is, is going to be inevitably beyond the scope of a small research team like this. Uh, in terms of international practice, I, I'm really curious to, to learn more about this. I know we have an expert on decentralization in our webinar. I'm happy to share with you some of the work of Thomas Bossert, whose work has, you know, informed all of my teaching and research on decentralization. Um, so we're happy to share some of his resources and maybe he'll add some thoughts in the chat. But looking at Scandinavia would also be interesting, um, but I'm, I don't have an answer in terms of where the right balance is struck. I think this is a universal challenge and making that discussion more explicit and considerate, I think is, will be a huge advantage. Uh, going forward. Thank you, Sarah. 
Uh, Rob, do you have a 30 second? Uh, <laughs> I've got all these. This I've got, I know the balance. I know the balance. One sec, 30 <laughs> seconds. Okay. Um, no, I think I just want to um, reiterate something that came out loud and clear in these interviews, which again, thank you so much for all the participants of those um, um, interviews. Uh, they, they spoke to the really uh, intense need for um, public health systems research, public health as an object of study. It is often um, not um, um, examined with the same depth that healthcare systems um, uh, um, are. Um, its complexity in public health is deserved of um, resources and, and time and close attention and minds. And so many people, especially as mentioned in this room, or have been leading that work for a while. And I think we, um, especially now post pandemic, you know, through that deliberate and sustained investment in public health system research, um, we'll be able to start answering those tough questions such as striking the balance. I don't know if that's a cop out, but thank you so much for, uh, for that, everyone for sharing Fantastic. your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both of you for uh, the uh, the excellent presentation and uh, this uh, fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, thank you to all of our participants. Uh, if you would like to, uh, if you're interested in knowing more about the, uh, the research work and the profile Sarah was mentioning in our presentation, uh, you can visit the NCCHPP uh, website. Uh, the link will be provided in the in the chat box, um, and uh, the profiles are already. Uh, some of the profiles are already on our website, and um, uh, so uh, I will uh, put an end to this. And uh, hands up for uh, for our uh, speakers, and thank you very much to everyone.